We have heard a fascinating presentation by Professor Havel yesterday. I would like to start by expressing a modest dissent with his position and with position made famous by Professor Yoram Hazoni, Hazoni an Israeli-American political thinker. The position is that nation state is good as a form and scope of government and empire, any empire, is necessarily bad. Uh, I don't think so. I think there are, I think that nation state is a legitimate form of government, perhaps the most natural one for our civilization in this age. But that does not mean necessarily that all empires were bad or destructive. Sometimes an empire should be preferable to particularly nasty nation states. Well, Professor Havel mentioned a heroic Maccabean uprising against a crazy emperor, let us call him, Antiochus Epiphanes. However, if we look even at earlier times, Jews were held in Babylonian captivity. Who released them from Babylonian captivity and allowed them to return back to Jerusalem? Well, Persian Empire led by Emperor Kiros or Cyrus. So Persian Empire was not so bad for Jewish national and religious history, and that's why for Christianity later on. Let us talk about the Roman Empire. I would definitely prefer a Roman Empire with Octavian and Senate and rule of law to despotism of Cleopatra and her nation state Egypt and eventually British Empire. A British Empire in my view, especially in the 19th century, but in the first half of the 20th century as well, was a force in the world for civility, freedom, rule of law and fair play. Had I been a native of Uganda in Africa in the 60s, would I prefer to live as a subject of Her Majesty the Queen under British rule of law, or would I prefer to be a subject or citizen of an independent nation state called Uganda run by Idi Amin? The question answers itself. And to conclude this opening remark, we are now in a beautiful Central European city, Zagreb. I come from another Central European city, Prague, and some 110 years ago, we were part of the, of the same empire. If you look at the alternatives in those times, on the one hand, militarist Germany, on the other hand, Russian absolutist Tsarist Empire, to the Southeast Ottoman Empire, just at the border uh, Serbian nation state, captured by a maniacal group, a junta of fanatics, murderous fanatics, who killed their own king in 1903, then tried to kill Emperor Franz Josef, and eventually they succeeded to kill Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo starting the great European suicide called World War I. Considering those alternatives, I would still prefer to live under Habsburg Empire, which does not mean that all empires are just beneficent and good. There were really evil empires. We remember the phrase, 1983, one American president, you can see him on the poster in the lobby, Ronald Reagan, called the Soviet empire an evil empire. And of course he was right. There was another um, evil empire, uh, Nazi empire. So like nation states, empires could be forces for human dignity and liberty, or forces subjugating human beings and trying to impose a vicious ideology on them. And now let us look at our contemporary situation. We are living in the European Union. I myself am not in support of Czechsit, of Czech Republic leaving the European Union. Considering all alternatives, it's still, it seems to me, for us to be better inside than outside. However, 
I worry about the trend which could be called globalism and which consists of imposing a uniformity of opinion or morals or habits on all peoples living in the European Union, disrespecting our traditions, our cultural inheritance. And that ideology, uh, for a lack of better words, I would describe as woke progressivism. Uh, I would try to illustrate that ideology on two political issues, the issue of same-sex marriage and the issue of immigration and what to do with illegal immigrants in Europe. Most, I think even all, Western European countries have legalized and established so-called same-sex marriage. Well, it was their choice. My personal conviction, very deep conviction is there is no such a thing as a same-sex marriage. By the very nature of marriage, uh, relationship between two persons of the same uh, biological sex cannot be or constitute a marriage. But that's my own opinion. For philosophical reasons first, but for religious reasons as well. The Czech Republic is perhaps the most geographically Western of all Central European countries or the most Eastern of all Western European countries. So we are exactly on the ideological border and now there is a very huge pressure and political activity in the Czech Republic trying to legalize or establish by law uh, a legal institute called same-sex marriage. We have a registered partnership by law for uh, same-sex couples with something like a civil unions. It's acceptable to all. However, uh, there is a pressure that we must have what they call marriage equality. Marriage equality, that same-sex couple should have the same legal name, marriage, as have men and women. You can see that there are tolerated differences on issues of foreign policy in our European or Western European and American political discourses. On foreign policy, you can be a peacenik, an isolationist, or you can be an avid neoconservative interventionist. Both positions are acceptable. On economic issues, you can be a socialist. There are many socialists which are welcome in polite society. Or you can be a classical liberal. No problem with that. So political, natural political differences on both foreign policy and economic policy are being tolerated. However, there is a strange phenomenon that the diversity of political opinions is not being tolerated now on cultural and moral issues. We all must be radical liberals in our moral and cultural views. And you, if you are conservative, which means you hold liberal ideas of 20 years ago, you are being perceived as beyond the pale. That's an cultural imperialism of woke progressivism, trying not plurality or diversity or freedom of opinions, but uniformity and imposition of one moral, or I would say anti-moral, worldview on all. And that's the globalism undermining the sovereignty of nation states in their cultural, moral policies, which according to European Union basic laws, like Lisbon Treaty, is a province of nation states, by the way, family policy is a competence, a power of nation states, but we see a, a drive to impose one uniform uh, rule for the whole uh, European continent, disrespecting our traditions. Another practical issue of public policy is immigration. There was recently, a week or two weeks ago, a summit uh, of, the, of the Council of the European Union, the meeting of prime ministers and presidents, and there had to be an agreement on the immigration pact or migration consensus, uh, which was that uh, if there are, there are too many immigrants coming to Europe from the south and southeast, they should be redistributed to all nation states according to the number of inhabitants and 
wealth of those respective nation states. And if some nation states don't accept the quota of immigrants imposed on them, they should pay. They should pay. So something pay, like pay, paying a penalty. Uh, many supported that. Two countries, and two countries only, vetoed that. And those two countries were Poland and Hungary. And I asked myself, why not my country? Why not my prime minister? Why not prime minister of Slovakia? Another country, I, I, I have a part-time work. And I don't know why. Why only two prime ministers had the courage to veto that? Because think about that idea. We have no problems with accepting immigrants and refugees. We as a Czech society and Polish society especially, we welcomed millions of Ukrainian women and children because they were war refugees. And the war in Ukraine or Russian aggression against Ukraine uh, made crystal clear for all of us some basic conservative truth. First of all, weapons, arms are not necessarily evil. Weapons could be used for rightful and noble purposes like self-defense. Second, there are fundamental differences between men and women. Ukrainian examples show that. Men took arms and defended their country and sent their women and children to neighboring countries to safety, like Poland, Slovakia, Czech Republic, mostly. And we welcome that. However, and the third lesson from the Ukrainian war was that nationalism is not necessarily evil. Volodymyr Zelensky convinced a little bit Western liberals, left liberals, that nationalism could be a liberal nationalism, like Ukrainian nationalism in defense of a country against a brutal aggression. So nationalism, like nation state, like empire, could be a force for good as well as force for bad. It depends on the, on the goals of that nationalism. Uh, so we had no problems with accepting millions of refugees from Ukraine. Children, women of the same culture, very close language, not causing troubles. However, our people have been very reluctant since 2015 to accept young men of military age coming from North Africa and Middle East, hostile to our civilization, not conforming to our habits and morals. And that's the huge consensus of the people in my country and I believe in the all countries of Central Eastern Europe. And now, why to impose on us quotas of people who don't want to live here? They want to live in Germany or Sweden. Among us, which we don't see any reason to accept them. And the agreement would mean that, yes, we must surrender to the trend that immigrants will come and come and come. And we must accept them and redistribute them in the long term or even in the short term perspective is not a viable policy. The only viable policy is to use European powers to stop immigration and create safe havens for immigrants in Northern Africa and Middle East, in some territories of Northern Africa or Middle East, and give them humanitarian aid. Yes, we are wealthy, we Europe are healthy, wealthy, we can provide them with some decent standards of living. But we see that there is an imposition, uh, a globalist imposition of one policy uh, on all countries of the European Union. If the drive for uniformity is pushed too far, it could destroy European Union. We saw one very important country, the United Kingdom, leaving the EU. If the drive for uniformity is pushed to extremes and some ideologues of vote progressivism are trying to do that. They are those who will bury, will kill and bury the European Union, which I don't prefer now. And in a foreseeable future, I would like to, to keep some form of European integration and the European Union. Now we heard a brilliant lecture by Minister Kovac yesterday uh, about politics and the realities of politics in Europe. Uh, he mentioned that now the most important countries in the European Union are 
France and Germany, which is true, of course, obviously. In the past, when Britain was inside the EU, there was an axis London, Paris, Berlin. And London for us Central Europeans was a natural ally, resisting the madness of an ever closer union, meaning unification, and not only unification, uniformity. Political unity, economic unity, no problem with that, but uniformity of all details of all policies, that's just a sheer madness. That would be like trying to make California a new Texas or a Texas a new California. Uh, just try to walk or drive through Texas and announce them that they are going to be Californized. You will not be unharmed for very long. <laughs> um, now, what does it mean for us when, when, when there is no London counterbalancing Paris and Berlin, and there is an axis Paris-Berlin? Well, we must be the counterbalance. We meaning Central Europeans. Not only Visegrad for Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, but all of us. And I would like to, in my last remarks, uh, to remind you of the growing importance of Poland. Minister Kovac mentioned that there is a new axis, London, Warsaw, Kiev, Britain, Poland, Ukraine as a military axis. To a point, to a point it's true, uh, Britain, after leaving the EU, is still a European military power deeply involved in Europe's security. That's true. That's true, and I thank God for that. However, Poles, in my view, are very clairvoyant, and they see that to rely on Axis Paris-Berlin would be a fool's around. That their Poles must be strong, must be strong, militarily strong. Uh, now, Polish army is much stronger than German army. Uh, it, it's going to be a joke, I'm going to tell. If there is a war, between Poland and Germany again, Poles will capture Berlin in two hours. And that will be, that will be all. But that will not happen ever. Uh, hopefully. However, Polish, <laughs> Polish, Polish army, if, if their military built up, which they promise, 4% of their GDP on, on defense, 4% of GDP on defense is going to materialize and realize Polish army will be maybe next to Ukrainian one the strongest one on the European continent. And with military power and with economic power goes a political power too. So I think we must not think only in the terms of axis from west to the east, London, Washington, London, Brussels, Paris, Berlin, maybe Moscow, west east or east west, but we must think about an axis from the north to the south. Warsaw, Prague, Bratislava, Budapest, Zagreb, Ljubljana, maybe Bucharest, and Baltic states. And that would be a proper counterbalance to globalist med drive to um, impose uniformity on all of us. So my concluding recommendation and wish will be, uh, we should have much stronger and tighter relations with Poland, uh, which is culturally close to us, religiously, cultural, uh, culturally, and is going to be the next European military superpower. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>